Welcome back to Presenting the Past, a podcast series exploring the digitized collections of public radio and television in the American Archive of Public Broadcasting, otherwise known as the AAPB. I'm Christine Becker, Associate Professor in the Department of Film, Television, Theater at the University of Notre Dame and co-host of the ACA Media Podcast from the Society for Cinema and Media Studies. I'm pleased to be joined in this episode by Allison Perlman, Associate Professor of Film and Media Studies and History at University of California, Irvine. Allison has curated an exhibit at AmericanArchive.org titled On the Right, NET and Modern Conservatism. So I'm really excited to chat about this with you, Allison. Yeah, it's so wonderful to be here with you, Chris. Let's start with the context of the exhibit. So modern conservatism is in the title. What, how would you describe modern conservatism in this context? So throughout the 50s and into the 60s and, and, and maybe even beyond, Conservatism was somewhat of an umbrella term for three primary strands of American political thought. Um, There were people who were strenuously opposed to the New Deal and the expansion of federal power that sort of starts in the progressive era, but really expands in the 1930s. And they see this as leading the nation like on the path to socialism. There are other conservatives that we might think of as social traditionalists who are um, less concerned about the New Deal and more concerned about the fact that traditional ideas, especially those embedded in canonical texts of Western civilization or sacred texts from the Judeo-Christian tradition, are no longer holding sway in terms of how people make sense of who they are, how they live their lives, what sites of authority matter to them in their world. And then there was a group that we could just think of as anti-communists. And I, and I want to be clear that many, many, many people, I would say most people in the U.S. in the 1950s and into the 1960s were anti-communists. The conservative anti-communists were ones who thought that the U.S. strategy of containment, of coexisting with the Soviet Union, but trying to contain the spread of communist, communism was radically insufficient. The communism was this grave existential threat that we had to eradicate it. And that U.S. policy, both domestically and internationally, on the issue of, of communism was way too soft and way too timid. And so, the, so these three groups all are pretty convinced that American society is going in the wrong direction. They just understand what that wrong direction is in somewhat different ways. Um, the other thing that they share, which I think is is really crucial to how conservatism will develop in the second half of the 20th century, is they all understand themselves to be outside of mainstream political and cultural institutions, right? So they understand their beliefs to be vital, but they also think of they under they see themselves as being marginalized within national politics, within uh, the media within education. And so they have a very strong shared sense of marginalization or outsiderness and uh, are very committed to trying to find strategies to have more influence in these more mainstream institutions. Now, the other part of the title, NET and modern conservatism. So what can you tell us about NET or national educational television and your research interest in it? Yeah, so NET was initially created in 1952 as one of a number of organizations uh, funded and designed and overseen by the Ford Foundation. And the goal of these groups was to help nurture, support, expand, and develop a nascent non-commercial educational television sector. And NET's particular role in that constellation of groups was to distribute programming to local non-commercial educational television stations. And so one way to think about NET is that it was a precursor to some degree to PBS. So it was the primary uh, organization that distributed programming on a national basis to non-commercial television stations. So I'm I'm interested in NET in, in some ways as this uh, alternate space for public debate in the 1960s. I'm also really interested in it as this foundational organization that helps both set the stage for what happens to public media in subsequent decades, but also was a very different kind of experiment in non-commercial television. And also the the dynamic between the local and national, I found really fascinating there. And I think that'll come up in, in our conversation. So let's drill down a little bit uh, more closely then into the 1960s and this range of programs that NET did on conservatism. So what prompted them to focus on that um, and the state of the conservative movement in the 60s? Uh, conservatism was this burgeoning political force, but it, it was still in some ways a, a 
fringe political formation. Um, and so this interest in conservatism, I think, is just part and parcel of NET wanting to expand the range of perspectives and viewpoints um, available to TV consumers. My other sort of reigning hypothesis, and this is just my hypothesis, I've never actually seen the evidence to support it, is that by the late 1960s, which is re when the majority of these programs air, if people presumed that NET had an ideological bent, the presumption is that it tacked to the left, you know, and there's actually evidence to support that uh, their programming was somewhat sympathetic to more left political perspectives. And so I, my assumption is that part of their willingness to dedicate a number of shows to conservatism was an effort to restore a little bit of balance to the range of perspectives that they were giving voice to in their programming. Well, and to that point, that idea of perhaps coming from a particular place, you write in the exhibit overview, the shows in this exhibit are diverse aesthetically and ideologically as they explored conservatism from myriad vantage points. So what are some of those vantage points and how might this tie in with the idea of the NET trying to provide a kind of a range of ways of understanding conservatism at the time? Yeah, so one of the things that I was really struck by when I watched all of these programs kind of at once is that they don't distribute like a coherent, consistent perspective on how we should make sense of conservatism. So there are some programs like a series that aired in 1970 called Conservative Viewpoint, which is essentially five episodes of a bunch of men sitting around a table, like they all have glasses, they're all wearing skinny <laughs> ties, and they are talking about conservatism, you know, and they're so they're thematically organized. And these are shows in which NET essentially is suggesting that conservatism is a coherent political philosophy that we can best understand by asking political, uh, excuse me, conservative intellectuals, conservative politicians, like what conservatism means and how conservatives would approach topics like the role of the U.S. in the world, the role of government in individual lives, um, people's personal morality and so on. And so in some ways it's an affirmation or a legitimation of conservatism as a viable political philosophy that's best understood by talking to intellectual and political leaders. Those shows can, I think, be productively contrasted with other episodes that are looking at what would have been called at the time the radical right. So groups like the John Birch Society or uh, grassroots conservative activists who are tremendously concerned that the U.S. is not aggressive enough in its fight against communism. Those episodes, they certainly present conservatives uh, in those shows not as adherence to a legitimate philosophy, but actually as a threat to democratic institutions, right? Where these are people who are not uh, just expressing a different view about the role of the U.S. in the world or the proper way that we might want to address this, you know, the struggle at the time between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, but as people who are posing a threat to democratic institutions, to American liberalism, um, and that they are presented as, as um, a harbinger of something to fear rather than, you know, an, an equivalent political philosophy. And so there are, there's a way that the, the shows together are kind of parsing out what is legitimate conservatism and what is illegitimate conservatism. So it affirms that there is such a thing as legitimate conservatism. It's just not the John Burke Society. It's people like William F. Buckley and, and the writers for National Review. It's, you know, Milton Friedman. It's not Robert Welch, the head of, of the Burke Society. And we can listen to a couple of examples of this that I think capture some of that range. So first of all, um, a, a program handled Regional Report, The Republicans. Uh, what, you can, what can you tell us about this report? So this particular episode aired in 1966, and it primarily is asking uh, journalists from across the country to help us make sense of the state of the Republican Party after the really catastrophic defeat of Barry Goldwater in his run for president in 1964. And so the episode is this interrogation of a political party that is very much a minority party in U.S. politics. You know, Lyndon Johnson is in the White House. Democrats have substantive majorities in both houses of Congress. And the midterm elections of 1966 are on the horizon. And so the program is trying to get a sense of where are Republicans now, and especially where is the Goldwater ring or the conservative wing of the Republican Party 
as it's looking towards trying to regain some sort of national political power in the midterm elections. And so um, this clip is uh, the summation of the episode by Edwin Bailey, who is the producer of Regional Report, who in some ways is bringing together um, the different narratives that the show had presented to its audience. All right, let's give that a listen. Well, there is the picture. In California, the Goldwaterites, down but not out, making a last stand. In the South, a party torn between extreme segregation and the necessity of coping with the growing number of Negro voters. In the Northeast, a move toward progressivism in an attempt to crack the Democratic vote in the cities. You may have noticed that few of the Republicans on this program had much to say about the war in Vietnam. Our reporters asked about it, but most answers were noncommittal. They did show, however, that the Republicans are confident that popular distaste for that war will work to their benefit. History supports this feeling. It was Truman's war in Korea that led to spectacular Republican gains in 1950 and 1952. Johnson's war, as some Republicans already are calling it, is no more popular. Most Americans, I think, want us to get out of Vietnam, some through negotiation and some through victory, whatever that is in that confused struggle. If President Johnson could resolve the conflict, everything would change. But barring that, it seems highly probable that Democratic losses will be heavy this fall and the shattered, beaten Republican Party will gain a new lease on life. Uh, So we we do know what happened next. There's a nice little tease at the end of that. Before that, as you were noting, the Republican Party perhaps in this dire straits. And then we have this pretty pretty pivotal shift in history then as, as the Nixon administration comes in. Yeah, exactly. Right. So uh, the Republicans do pick up some seats in the Senate and the House in 1966. But 1968 is this really transformative moment where Nixon is able to win the presidency. And one of the things that I think is so fascinating about what we just listened to in Regional Report is that Bailey is acknowledging that there is no consensus amongst Republicans about how to move forward. You know, there are people like Reagan in California who thinks that Goldwater conservatism is the future of the party other people who think we need to distance ourselves as much as possible from Goldwater to be politically viable. But the one thing that they all agree upon is that the Vietnam War has created a civil war within the Democratic Party. And the best thing they can do is just step aside and let the Democrats hate each other. And so there's a way that this episode of Regional Report is really prescient because it both anticipates that Nixon or a figure like Nixon could win the White House, but it also acknowledges that part of that win isn't really about Republicans figuring out what is their relationship to conservatism. It's just about the Democratic Party falling apart. (laughs) Well, and then the other clip we have is more of that uh, fanatical right wing element that you raised before, which is uh, about um, an an NET journal on H.L. Hunt. So which can you tell us about H.L. Hunt? So H.L. Hunt, at the time that this episode was produced, was one of the richest men in the world. Um, He had built his fortune primarily through oil. But at this point, he has an incredibly vast commercial empire that touches on a range of different industries. Um, and so Hunt is, is a crucial figure in the story of conservatism, both for his own fairly rigid, I think we can say uh, fringe ideological beliefs, but also that he was willing to dedicate substantial resources to try to disseminate disseminate those beliefs in spaces of a kind of conservative counter sphere or a, a modes of conservative alternative media. Yeah, let's give a, a clip from that uh, segment a listen. Hunt spends millions each year in spreading his religious, super patriotic messages, anti anything that smacks to him of socialism. The effort costs him very little, if anything for the expense is largely absorbed in the food company's advertising budget. In effect, his propagandizing becomes a tax-exempt business expense. A representative of the Hunt-owned advertising agency explains the unusual advertising arrangement. Newton Advertising has as its major client and the one to whom we devote the largest part of our effort, HLH Products, which is one of the major sponsors of the Lifeline radio program, which is on 409 stations from the West Coast to the East and from Canada to Mexico. HLH Products also includes in its advertising program a large number of major newspapers throughout the United States. 
The newspaper ads are a two column by three inch ad, which are rather unique in that every other day a product ad runs and every other day a patriotic ad runs. Does right wing patriotism really sell chicken backs and mashed potatoes? HL8 Foods marketing manager gives the philosophy behind this strange approach. Our advertising reflects the character of our founder, Mr. H.L. Hunt. A great many national concerns base their advertising on sex appeal or the hard sell, shall we say, but ours is based upon American patriotism. And we hope that this patriotic approach to advertising will provide an added inducement for the housewife to select our excellent products. The Lifeline programs, narrated by Melvin Munn from the Washington Lifeline headquarters, are made available in printed form. These transcripts, called Munn scripts, reflect the tone of the Lifeline broadcasts. Not everyone agrees that Lifeline and the HLH Foods newspaper campaign are just a couple of more quite legitimate forms of advertising promotion. This is Dr. Franklin Littell, president of Wesleyan College and national chairman of the Institute of American Democracy, an organization devoted to counterattacking extremism, both of the right and left. With him is executive director, Mr. Charles Baker. The thing which is so disturbing about uh, Lifeline and similar organizational uh, efforts to, uh, to undermine the public confidence in our leadership uh, is that not that they have perverse opinions. We all have perverse opinions from time to time, uh, but that they impugn the integrity of anyone who has any other opinion. Uh, therefore, uh, they're destructive of the full, free, and informed dialogue, uh, which is the lifeblood of the open society. Uh, here we have, uh, in Mr. Hunt's program and in some others, corporate resource being used to, point a, to promote a point of view which uh, is hardly in the mainstream of, American, the, of the American political dialogue. It's beyond conservatism, which obviously is a legitimate viewpoint, a, a, a point of view which implies that people who accept welfare, for example, are involved in some sort of communist plot and that social progress like Medicare, Mr. Hunt has been against Medicare, uh, this is a, is a dangerous thing and we are selling the country down the road to, to socialism and as every, everyone who follows the radical right dialectic knows, uh, liberalism equals socialism equals communism, they equate the whole thing so that it's really an attempt to, to uh, turn back the clock on progress to think of America in terms of yesteryear when we didn't have, or at least we're not aware of some of the problems that now uh, we, seek with, we seek to cope with. Well, and one thing in listening to that, it's, it seems so much very much of its time and, you know, very much of the rhetoric um, seems very heated for the time. And yet it also seems to point toward things in, in the present and even current movements about kind of fringe spheres, I guess, if I can, you know, pick up on that word you used. One of the ways in which the conservative media of the period somewhat anticipates the conservative media of our own time, in which listeners or viewers or readers were both being instructed within a political ideology, but are also being instructed to uh, distrust, to fear, to see as not different, but actually as a threat alternate political beliefs, alternate sites of media, alternate sites of information, you know. Um, and one other thing that I think is so key about Hunt is that he very much conflated his understanding of the role of the U.S. government, the role of uh, the necessity to be strident against anti-communism, which for, for him would have been a giant umbrella of things uh, to be opposed to, uh, was the core definition of American patriotism. So that if you disagreed with him, you weren't just somebody who disagreed with him, you were someone who was posing a threat to the nation rather than just imagining a different political future for the nation. The exhibit also features, uh, you know, perhaps the most prominent conservative intellectual in the 1960s, William F. Buckley Jr., and uh, of course had his own show on public television. So what can you tell us about Buckley and, you know, comparisons with what NET was doing and, and what he was doing with media? 
So Buckley's series Firing Line, which is, I think many of the episodes are available through the Hoover Institution, and I think the American Archive for Public Broadcasting website has linked to them. So uh, I really recommend folks checking them out. Actually, it airs pri- not exclusively, but primarily um, over public television. So first through NET, later on through PBS, there's a short period where it's on commercial television. Um, and I believe it first is broadcast in 1966. And so Firing Line is forming, uh, you know, in, in the midst of these other programs about conservatism on NET. And um, I, Heather Hendershot's book on Firing Line has been really useful for me in thinking through how to make sense of the NET programs. And one of the things that she suggests is that Buckley uses firing line, especially in this period, you know, especially post Goldwater and anxieties about radical fringe conservative groups to create a space for a legitimate conservative figure that is distinct from the crazies that you know, Buckley wants to say is, is not part of legitimate conservatism. And, and Buckley himself, his, his National Review magazine, which he started in 1955, distances itself from the John Birch Society most aggressively in 1965. Um, and Buckley is a, is a prominent figure in the NET exhibit. So he probably appears more than anybody else. Um, so there's this really remarkable debate he has with James Baldwin um, at the Cambridge Union. Buckley loses, uh, kind of, uh, the students say he loses, but they're just, they're speaking in really different debates, you know, and uh, it's kind of remarkable to see. Uh, NET Journal does a profile of Buckley as well, um, which I think much like the Conservative Viewpoint series is pretty sympathetic to Buckley and it gives a lot of space to uh, Buckley in voice over reading his own work and kind of expounding on ideas and um, and is, is a somewhat sympathetic portrait of him. And then possibly my favorite episode in the entire exhibit, it's just, it's really of its moment, is uh, an episode from a, a local the local Boston um, station, WGBH. So the, the title is What's Happening, Mr. Silver? Essentially this like young, young Tufts professor with William F. Buckley in a giant room and there are all of these photographs in it. And basically Mr. Silver and William F. Buckley walk around this room and look at pictures and just chat. So they, they talk about the Beatles, you know, or they talk about Bonnie and Clyde, or they talk about Moshe Dayan, you know, and they talk about Richard Dixon. And it's just this really far reaching, feel, uh, freewheeling conversation where Buckley is like remarkably charming and is somewhat open-minded, especially on topics like drug use, um, but also, you know, very clearly committed to conservative perspectives. And, and it actually, at this moment, is is pretty excited about the possibility of Richard Nixon becoming president and defends Richard Nixon against allegations that he's not smart enough, essentially, <laughs> to be president. So, like, Buckley's show and its longevity on public television is, I think, part of demonstrating its commitment to a diverse range of political perspectives. Um, but also Buckley's prominence in the exhibit very much underscores how he was just the most prominent public intellectual or public face of conservatism in the 1960s. And NET certainly acknowledged that. And as far as reactions to NET in general, it is the case that it didn't last for very long. So can you tell us what became of NET after this period? In 1967, in November, Congress passes the Public Broadcasting Act, creates the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. One of the things that Congress does is it says the Corporation for Public Broadcasting is going to receive public monies. You know, it can fundraise, it will distribute money, but it cannot oversee the interconnection of local non-commercial TV stations. And so NET in 1969 uh, basically submits a petition to the corporation and says, we would like to do this. Like, this has been our job since 1950, really 1960, it was created in 52, but really since 1954, we want to stay in this job. And um, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, in conversation with the Ford Foundation, decides not to do that um, and instead creates the Public Broadcasting Service. And so this is kind of the end of NET's road. <laughs> it kind of knows it. So um, in 1970, NET merges with WNDT in New York, which is the local public television station in New York. It continues to produce programming into the 1970s under the auspices of NET, but ultimately NET and WNDT will become WNET, and WNET still is one of the most important producing stations for the public 
television network. But NET creates these really remarkable programs in the late 60s and into the 1970s, but it really tussles with uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and PBS, both uh, in terms of its wanting to maintain its editorial autonomy, but also it wants to maintain a particular kind of um, adversarial understanding of what non-commercial television should be, which is really difficult to sustain when you're being supported by public monies. Mm, yeah. And again, that the local and national conflict comes up there, too. And the idea of, uh, you know, I always when I teach history of television, talk about PBS, it's both the great glory of what makes PBS unique is, is really reliance on the local. And that's also at the same time what makes it so hard for PBS to actually compete with like the national networks or now streaming um, because of that diversity ends up being competitively a really difficult position it's put in. So it's really interesting to hear the historical roots of some of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I also believe and I think this is probably correct, is that a lot of the affiliates throughout the 1960s had a somewhat love-hate relationship with NET. I mean, so NET really wanted to be this like countervailing force that, you know, addressed controversial topics and did experimental programming. And there are a lot of local stations um, that are run by state commissions, by funded, funded by state legislatures, have a really different understanding of what public television should do, and uh, are getting these programs from NET that they perceive will either get them in trouble with local political officials or will really anger their local publics who they're relying on for patronage, you know, for contributions and so on. And PBS itself is constituted as a member station organization, right? Like PBS is there to represent the stations and to serve the stations. And um, and NET ostensibly had that goal, but in practice really sometimes saw itself as having to get around the will of the stations rather than to actually try to serve the diverse needs always of this very heterogeneous sector. Right. And this also goes to show the fraught nature of any public media in this country. And then you tie it back in with the conservatism and the notion of like trying to deal with doing reports on political parties that can end you. You know, that's also a real kind of complex element of all of this. I'm at least grateful that we have the AAPB archive around then to allow us to still access this past material. So where can listeners go to find the exhibit and watch all this incredible footage? Um, So the exhibit is hosted on the American Archive of Public Broadcasting's website, which I think is AmericanArchive.org. And the exhibit is a collection of 21 episodes that you can stream on the site, as well as somewhat short contextual essays that I've written to help people make sense of the broader context in which these episodes would have aired. So I recommend everyone to check out the really remarkable, amazing, vital American Archive for Public Broadcasting, uh, which is like only something I could have dreamed about in 2013 when I was at the Library of Congress, like watching things on like 16 millimeter film and like VHS cassette and whatnot. Wow. And there are a number of just excellent, amazing exhibits on the site beyond the one on conservatism um, that I think people would find fascinating. Well, that, that was a really fascinating conversation, Allison. I look forward to looking at the exhibit and I encourage all of our listeners to check it out. So thanks so much for the chat. Thank you. It was really wonderful to talk with you, Chris. I'm just so honored to get to be here with you. So thanks so much. Thank you to all the listeners out there for joining us for this second episode of Presenting the Past. I'd also like to thank sound engineer Todd Thompson at the University of Texas at Austin for his post-production work on this podcast and for composing our theme music. And thank you to Rin Marchese at the AAPB for helping to organize these podcasts. Please join us next month for another deep dive into the digital resources of the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. GBH.